is acquired characteristics are not transmitted to the next generation. And so Lamarck's theory was falsified, even though it makes many, many predictions. It explains much. So what we need to do if we are to consider Genesis as a scientific hypothesis is to explore how it can be falsified. That is the essence of science. What sort of predictions does it make that we could test against empirical data and either corroborate the hypothesis or falsify it? And one of those predictions, at least in Kent's interpretation, is that the Earth is 6,000 years old. Now, if that were the case, uh, we would have found that to be the case uh, using radiometric dating methods. When we do that, we find that the oldest rocks on Earth are something of the order of 3.8 billion years, not 6,000 years. And even here in Michigan, uh, we have uh, bones that we can uh, carbon date that are more than 6,000 years old. And so I don't see how, uh, within the scientific methodology, one can uh, say that creation as a theory is anything but falsified. Now, we could carry that further, um, but in order to do so, we would have to make the Genesis hypothesis more precise. And one of the terms we've got to pin down is this word, this term, kind. What is a kind? And I put that question to Kent right now. Yes, please speak <clears throat> on my time. Um, on your time? You may, you may speak on my time. Oh, okay. Um, so that I can... I guess I would like to maybe ask, ask you a question also to go along with your question. What is a species? A wolf and a dog are classed as a different species, yet they are interfertile. Uh, we have Canis lupus, Canis domesticus, so there's never been a good solid definition of species either. I would say the average five-year-old could tell you uh, if two animals are in the same kind. For instance, if you get a horse and a zebra, they're probably the same kind of animal. Uh, but a horse and a banana are not. So I think it would go back to the micro-macro evolution. Um, all we've ever observed is animals bringing forth after what anybody, anybody of average intelligence would consider the same kind. A Great Dane and a Chihuahua, though they're very different, are still the same kind of animal. So I'm, I'm not, I can't give you a solid definition of the word. I can tell you things that obviously are not the same kind, the horse and the banana. And I can tell you that the evolution theory does say the horse and the banana came from a common ancestor, and I can say that's not science. Um, but it seems to me that if God created kinds and revealed this in Genesis, uh, that uh, it should be known with sufficient precision that you'd be able to begin to state some of the properties. Specifically, what I'm looking for is what the genetic boundaries uh, might be. Uh, for example, um, it is problematic with domestic dogs and particularly their relationship to wolves. And um, the thinking is right now uh, that actually dogs are wolves, uh, the genetic data uh, for a very close relationship of dogs to wolves is, is simply compelling. Uh, and uh, coyotes are not uh, much, more, much more distant. So would you cre consider those distinct species? Uh, where would you put an animal like um, a dingo in relation to those, uh, or a hyena, for example? Are they a distinct kind? Or are they the same kind? And how can we delimit these boundaries so that we can begin to test whether there are it's plausible that there were distinct creations of these. And, and as I said earlier, it's, it's essential that the theory be elaborated in a sufficiently precise way that we can make these tests. And uh, but before, uh, let me speak uh, uh, actually to this, uh, this issue of what is a species. Um, this is my area of research. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. 
Uh, now, actually, and, and this is a pervasive problem uh, or a pervasive topic of discussion, let me put it that way. It's really not a problem uh, in evolutionary biology. I just came back from uh, an international ornithological congress um, in uh, Durban, South Africa, and there was a whole session, symposium, devoted to species definitions, and believe me, it was very contentious. Uh, however, Darwin, in a sense, wrote the origin of species, but he also created the problem, what is a species? Because before Darwin's time, uh, before Darwin wrote the origin of species, there was no problem with what a species was. It was each individual distinct act of creation. But what Darwin said is a species arises in a continuum. And the problem is that when we see species, we see distinct entities. Even though uh, wolves and dogs can interbreed, uh, anyone, uh, <clears throat> at least anyone better, be able to tell the dis difference between a dog and a wolf. There is a profound difference between them. And there's this discontinuity. There, there are really few intermediate forms. There are no intermediate forms between bananas and, and dogs or, or whatever example uh, it can't can't gave. And the problem with defining species, I argue, is the same as that in defining kind. A process of evolution has occurred, and as a result, there are circumstances, there are situations that are in transition. One of the groups of birds that I work on, the flickers, the red and yellow shafted flickers of North America, are a prime example of two entities that were recognized as distinct species. They were described as such by, by uh, uh, actually, I think, by Linnaeus, uh, and certainly recognized as such by Audubon. And then suddenly, one day, uh, there was a small hybrid zone found on the Great Plains, and it was found that they interbreed. It's a case where they are in the process of speciation. And this is why evolutionary biologists have a difficult time defining species. There are these intermediate situations. But Genesis, special creation, it seems to me, doesn't predict that. Why would a creator create things that were sort of capable of hybridization, that were intermediate, that weren't clearly defined? I simply don't know. Well, I would point out that probably the two types of birds that uh, are now creating a hybrid zone may have indeed come from a common ancestor. It was a bird. Uh, that would again be a, just a classic example you just gave of microevolution. That's not an example at all to help you know, the general theory of evolution. Uh, what I've seen is exactly what I predicted at the beginning. There will be lots of examples of microevolution. And then people are left to make the giant faith of leap and logic into believing that that somehow proves the whole general theory of macroevolution. Uh, you gave us an example of two types of birds that are able to uh, uh, breed together. You asked, what is a kind? I don't know that I can answer the question. Uh, yeah, well, are, are all birds one kind? No, or? no. I don't know how many original kinds of birds there were. Uh, there's probably a lot of new varieties today. Uh, but can we... Uh, then regardless of how many kinds there were, uh, maybe we could figure that out if we could determine what distinguishes one kind from another in a genetic sense. Where, what is the barrier? When, when would we know yes. that we've crossed from one kind to I think another? That is a very valuable area of research, and that's the type of research scientists ought to be doing. That's perfectly legitimate. That has nothing to do, though, with the general theory of evolution.